One would obviously you are making excellent progress. My only fear is that if in attempting to hurry the patient, you awaken in him a sense of his real position. For you and I, who see his position as it really is, must never forget how totally different it ought to appear to him. We know that we have introduced a change in direction to his course, which already is taking him out of his orbit around the enemy. But he must be made to imagine that all the decisions which have affected this change are trivial and revocable. He must never suspect that he is already, even slowly, moving out of his orbit around the sun into a line which will take him out into the cold and dark of space. For this reason, I'm almost glad that he's still a churchgoer. I know there are some dangers in this, but almost anything is better than that he should realize the break he has made with the first few months of his Christian life. As long as he retains externally the habits of a Christian, he can be made to think of himself as one who has just picked up a few new friends and amusements, but whose spiritual state is much the same as it was six weeks ago. And while he thinks that, we do not have to contend with the explicit repentance of a definite, fully recognized sin, but only with the vague, though uneasy, feeling that he hasn't been doing very well lately. This dim uneasiness needs careful handling. If it gets too strong, then it may wake the patient up and spoil the whole game. But if you suppress it entirely, which, by the way, the enemy will probably not allow you to do, then we lose an element in the situation which can be put to good use. If such a feeling is allowed to live, but not allowed to become irresistible and flower into real repentance, then it has one invaluable tendency. It increases the patient's reluctance to think about the enemy. Now, all humans at all times have some such reluctance, but when thinking of him causes them to face an intensifying vague cloud of half-conscious guilt, that reluctance is increased tenfold. They hate anything that causes even the slightest thought of him, just as a man in financial embarrassment hates even the sight of a bank. In this state, your patient will not omit, but will increasingly dislike his religious duties. He will think of them as little as he decently thinks he can beforehand, and will forget them as soon as possible after they are over. A few weeks ago, you had to tempt him towards unreality and inattention in his prayers. But now, you will find him opening his arms to you, practically begging you to distract his purpose and benumb his heart. He wants his prayers to be unreal, for nothing scares him more than direct contact with the enemy. He wants to let sleeping worms lie. As this condition becomes more fully established, you will gradually be freed from the tiresome business of providing pleasures as temptations. As the uneasiness, and his reluctance to face it, cut him off more and more from all real happiness, and as habit renders the pleasures of vanity, excitement, and flippancy both less pleasant and harder to forego, for that is fortunately what habit does to a pleasure, you will find that anything and nothing is sufficient to distract his wandering attention. You no longer need a good book which he really enjoys to keep him from his prayers or work or sleep. A cereal box will do. You can make him waste his time not only in conversation he enjoys with people whom he likes, but in conversations with people whom he does not care for at all, and on subjects which he finds boring. You can make him do nothing at all for long periods of time. You can keep him up late at night, not partying, but staring at a dead fire in a cold room. All of the healthy and outgoing activities which we want him to avoid can be inhibited, and nothing given in return. We want him to be able to say, as one of my patients did when he arrived down here, I now see that I spent my life doing neither what I ought, nor what I liked. The Christians are fond of describing the enemy as one without whom nothing is strong. And nothing is very strong. Strong enough to steal away someone's best years, not in sweet sins, but in the flickering of the mind over it knows not what and knows not why, in the gratification of curiosities so feeble that the creature is hardly aware of them, in the drumming of fingers, in the kicking of heels, in the whistling of tunes they do not like, in the long, dim labyrinth of daydreams, which have neither lusts nor ambition to give them relish, but which once started by chance association, the creature is too weak and fuddled to shake off. You will say that these are very small sins. And doubtless, like all young tempters, you are anxious to report spectacular wickedness. But do remember, the only thing that matters is the extent to which you are able to separate the patient from the enemy. It does not matter how small the sins, so long as the cumulative effect is to edge them away from the light and into the nothing. Murder is no better than cards if cards will do the trick. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, with no sudden turnings, no milestones, and no signposts. <laughs>